Help Systems webinar. Halcyon Level 3, what's in it for me? Five reasons Halcyon Level 2 customers should activate Level 3. We're coming to you from beautiful Eden Prairie, Minnesota, here in the USA, as well as Peterborough in the UK. Thanks for joining us. So whether you're a longtime user of Halcyon Monitoring or got there through our Messenger Plus upgrade path, you've got a powerful tool at your disposal. But you're only beginning to scratch the surface. By upgrading to the next level of Halcyon, you'll be able to address storage issues, spool file management, performance analysis, and institute more sophisticated alerting. Does this sound interesting? Well, it's more than just interesting. There's measurable return on investment as well as peace of mind. So my name is Chuck Lisinski, and I am the Director of Technical Solutions here at Help Systems. And I'm your co-pilot today, along with one of our IBM power champions, Ash Giddings, longtime IBM I guru. Hi, Ash. Good morning, good afternoon to, uh, to everybody, and thank you for, uh, for joining us today. Yeah, so logistics for today will be about uh, 45 minutes with our webinar. I'll be the color, co color commentator for Ash and also be monitoring any questions that might uh, pop in. So feel free to send us any questions you might have about our topic today, and uh, we'd like to hear from you. Thank you, Chuck. Well, before we, uh, we get into today's uh, webinar, I thought it was worthwhile um, highlighting, or I guess reiterating, uh, what Halcyon looks like really, what the landscape's like. I know the vast majority of Halcyon customers, have um, they kind of live here. They have IBMI, typically a number of partitions, anywhere between two and 222, and they run the I software, a lot of which they push alerts through to this guy in the middle, the centralized console or the enterprise console, as we call it. And obviously this console can be, um, um, can be shared. You can have as many enterprise console clients as you like. So anybody with a vested interest in, in managing the I or any other platform can have a console client on their laptop, on their desktop. Um, we see a lot on service desks. Um, and of course, you can also have that, uh, that client on any Android or Apple device. So you can manage your, your IBM I alerts from mobile devices. So they're available from the App Store, from Google Marketplace or from the Apple App Store, free of charge. And uh, it's a simple process to be able to see your alerts there. And of course, you can get those alerts out as, a, as an email or an SMS and via some, some neat escalation either at the back end of the console or even directly from the eye. And of course, the console can also receive traps, SNMP traps. So any pubs, switches, routers, printers, uh, environmental equipment, uh, absolutely anything. If it has an IP address and has the ability to, to generate a trap, you can point those traps to this console. So that's all, all capable of, uh, of, of, being, of, of being achieved quite easily. And then, of course, we can also monitor other platforms as well. So Windows Linux, so that's Linux on x86 and on Power, um, AIX and Vios. So if you're running Vios on your Power machines, it's key to monitor Vios. If you lose Vios or lose both partitions of Vios, you've lost the whole box. So again, we put a slim down agent on there enable you to, to create rules and create actions and to share this, uh, this centralized console. And just again, before we, uh, we launch into the webinar, we've actually just finished a, a piece of work. Um, we've now connected our advanced reporting suite to the console. So previously, this reporting suite was capable of talking directly to these platforms and gathering I guess traditional performance related metrics, CPU disk, memory, those kind of things. The work we've just finished enables you to, uh, to capture alert statistics. So how many alerts have I raised? Um, how many of alerts have I raised from IBM I? What time is my most frequent alert? 
how long have alerts been open for, or how long were they open for before I acknowledge them? All of those kind of things are now capable via templates, via the advanced reporting suite. So today we're talking about level three and what's in it for me. And um, this, this is what Alcyon looks like. So we've got quite a number of products and several years ago, we decided to split them into suites just for simplicity really. So although level one is, uh, is, is, is what we call our, it's a baby suite, most people, this is the entry level, level two. And these are the, these are kind of the products we're talking about today. So these are the products that um, I guess differentiate level two to level three. So we're going to spend uh, going to spend some time in each and one of these uh, these five areas today, just to show you some of the some of the capabilities and some some kind of real life use cases for those. And then of course level four is is everything here plus the scheduler. All right, well, let's launch our first polling question of the day. We are looking for your feedback. And the question is, which IBM I industry publications do you read? IBM Systems Magazine. Uh, I read the online version, of course. Um, the PowerWire EU. That comes in the form of a regular email blast. IT Jungle. A lot of diverse articles in IT Jungle, MC Press, or other. Feel free to send us some feedback. I'll give you 20 more seconds or so to answer these. Ash, do you have a preference? I read all of those, you know. <laughs> I often uh, I often stockpile those, and uh, they're, they're often sitting in my inbox. But um, I do make sure I, uh, I I do read each and one of those. Yes. Yeah. What about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm like you. Sometimes I do stockpile, but yes, I do read all those. I tend to focus on maybe, if anything, a little bit more on IT jungle. Yeah. All right, we're going to close, uh, and we'll share the results now. And so IBM Systems Magazine looks, or IT jungle actually comes out on top. IBM Systems Magazine, and then MC Press and uh, PowerWire. Very interesting. Thanks for participating in our first poll. All right, there we go. Okay, so our agenda as uh, mentioned by Ash, we're gonna look at uh, disk storage. We're gonna look at some intelligent alerting. We're gonna look at the uh, performance reporting. So the devil's in the detail, so to speak, when it comes to performance. We're gonna look at managing spool files as well as log monitoring, and we'll spend maybe about five minutes on each of these areas. And we're going to start out with the Disk Space Manager and Disk Explorer. And so I, I think of things like this, like how many old save files or old backups of libraries, and you know, don't forget about the IFS dumping ground junk pile that might be on your system. Many people don't know or really don't bother to start exploring this storage until there's a problem naturally, and then it's crunch time. So there's a better way given the right tool, and level three does have this functionality. So speaking of return on investment, you may just save your company a storage upgrade. And if you do use retrieve disk information, there might be a few challenges there to say the least. So Ash, let's look at how Disk Manager compares. Yeah, sure, Chuck. Thank you. So we're going to start off with um, with Disk Space Manager. So um, we're just in here. I'm just going to spend a little while on the green screen. I know I promised some some GUI activity, but we'll have a look on the green screen. So Disk Space Manager, it um, it doesn't give you any real time alerting. You've got that in Level Two anyway. Um, so Level Two is your I guess your your eyes, your ears. It's going to monitor things. It's going to tell you things have, have happened. Level three, a lot of it is um, is the devil behind the detail. So if we if we focus on uh, the disk space manager part, and it's, uh, it, it's I guess it's sister, the disk explorer. Um, typically, what happens here is we similar to retrieve disk inf, 
we schedule um, regular disk builds. So this might be weekly, this might be every night, totally up to you. And this is typically the, um, the, the kind of analysis that we want to do. We can select how much or how, how little data to pull in and to look at and how long to keep it for, in essence. That would then run every night or every week and we then have lots of data to look at and to analyze. And the Disk Space Manager allows you to, to, to delve into that data. So um, let's take a, take a little look in here. So we're gonna view the data that we've collected over the days and, and months. And um, the first thing you notice is, hey, we've got lots of options here. We've got lots of different views that we can, uh, that we can take a look at. Some of these are shipped. In fact, most of these are shipped with the product. But you can also design your own views. So if there's if there's data that's interesting to you, you can design a view and go straight into that. But let's take the lid off the power machine and go straight into the uh, into the root. These are all the builds I've got. I think I run them uh, weekly. But I'm just going to look at my uh, my latest one. So we've done exactly what I said. We've we've taken the lid off the machine. We're looking into into root. And this is what we see. So we see all the file systems. We see um, data that's stored at root level, but we also see file systems as well. So we, I guess we've got directories here. We've got stream files that probably shouldn't be there, but we've got a selection of things here. So I guess the first thing I wanted to cover is, um, you know, level two can tell you why you hit an ASP threshold. Maybe you hit 90% last week. You can use the Disk Space Manager to actually see um, why you hit it. You know you've hit it, but, but you know why did you hit it? So we can delve into uh, into different areas here. I guess the uh, the most interesting area when we're trying to find out um, why we hit that would we'll make, maybe go to all user. So this is our all user area here, all user libraries. We're no longer at root level. We're in all user. And we can see how big it is. All user libraries, 53 gig. So what can I do with this uh, this data here? Well, this little underline here, this is uh, this is your friend. And wherever that's displayed, that means that's where you're sorted. So if we want to sort on object size, we can just use F16. And quickly, we can see the size of the largest object, performance data. No real surprise on the, on this box, but we can keep going into that. We can drill in to the next level. And again, we can sort. We're now into a, into actually into a Halcyon library, HDM prod. We can sort, we can sort, sort by object change as well. So this, this is quite key. There's lots of other views as well. So if I toggle around here with F11, we can see other information as well. Lots and lots of information there we can see. Let me just jump out of here and go back into it. So let's go back into root. And this is what we see. Other things we can see here at a glance are these with an asterisk at the front. These are applications. So these are things that we've created. We've got robot HA. So I can treat a, a group of libraries and IFS folders as an application and I can manage it as an application. I can see how big that application is and handle it that way. So as I say, you can, uh, you can quite quickly see what's changed. If we jump into all user, let's look at size change. So that's size change since the last build. And that's a, a differentiator between this and the the OS Retrieve Disk Inf. Retrieve Disk Inf is great, but it gives you a one-time view. You're viewing the data at the time it was built. With this, you can compare different builds. So I think we can see here, again, this is a performance-related data. On this box, hey, it's just jumped 37 meg, not a big problem. What else can I do here? Well, if I jump into a different view, um, Let's have a look in here. Big files, I've not been very imaginative, particularly on this box, but I've got a view that I've created called big files. Again, if I look at my current build, 
I'm interested in uh, in files that are greater than five meg, your environment will be different. But I can see at a glance, I've actually sorted this view by default. So if I'm interested, if I see my disk space creeping up, I can jump into big files, my big files view, and see what the biggest object is across the whole box, irrespective of library. Really, really powerful. I could also see, again, if I toggle around here, I can see, and uh, I'll hold my hand up here, I can see if my save strategy is working, because I can see the last save date of these objects. Fortunately, these are uh, these are test partitions. We don't have any production data on here at all, so um, I'll hold my hand up and say I don't back this uh, this partition up. But in your environment, this will be of interest. You'll be able to see at a glance and flag anything that's not being saved. Uh, what else can we do in here? I think Chuck mentioned it. Save files. Every single box I've been on has got a save file called a save file or a library called delete me and nobody ever dare delete it but i've got a view here called savfs and again anything greater than uh, i think 100 meg great again it's looked at, looked across my whole system and it's looking for save files that are of a certain size i might want to change that so uh, let me have a look in here 20. Bear with me one moment. Uh, we can go to, we can display it in different formats. So we, we might be interested in a, in a slightly different format. Um, we can also customize this as well. So this is what we're seeing at the moment. We're looking at save files. We're looking across the whole machine and we're looking across, we're looking in a flat mode. And this is what I'm interested in. Anything bigger than 100 meg, that's a save file. Obviously I can customize this display. So I might be interested in things that have changed or changed by a certain number of percentage. And once I've got this customized, I can save that as a view. Really, really easy to use this. And for those of you who don't like the green screen, there is also a, a GUI equivalent. So exactly what I've done on the on the green screen, I can do from a GUI. The advantage here is that I can manage multiple partitions. I've just got a couple listed here. So exactly what I've just done there, 720p6. It handles IASPs as well. Uh, here's my all user. Let's uh, let's find how prod. I can click on that. And in this panel here, I see the contents of how prod. So the same columns, the same ability, I can sort here. I have got the ability to, to print reports as well from here. So if you remember the views that we had on the green screen, any of those views, we could say, we want to turn this into a report. So a report is just a view output to print so anything that we've uh, that we've saved as a report we can actually print those green screen reports but print them from a GUI and it just takes a few seconds for uh, initial load we're pulling these back from Eden Prairie to the UK but these are all my views or reports that I can produce so uh, let's have a look at this so this is objects by size increase so let's just do a quick preview of this so quite quickly, at a glance, I can see the, the objects that have changed or increased recently. Dead easy to use. Um, I tend to I tend to focus on the green screen. I don't use GUIs unless I think they're um, they're valuable. But um, I think the Disk Explorer GUI definitely brings something to the table. It it helps IBM I feel normal. I think, which is uh, which is a big thing in my book. And just one other thing I wanted to show you. And again, we can do this from the GUI. I think this is more powerful from the green screen, is around the view here. This is one that a customer actually asked us for. This is a library overview. So they wanted to know not what the library was, what is now, but how it compared to last week, week before, the week before that. So we've got 
the ability to have like a, a role in six weeks of those libraries or of those objects and also how much of the disk that particular library occupies you can do all sorts of things with uh, with views you can build your own builds and formats and everything and have exactly the data you're interested in displayed both from green screen and uh, and from a, view, a, a GUI Ash, I can only think that if people spent a little bit more time with their disk management on a weekly basis and paid attention to something like this, they could absolutely save from a disk upgrade or save at least some time before they need to upgrade and potentially, um, you know, if you if you keep your disk space nice and tidy, uh, you're gonna you're gonna plateau on your usage. Right? I think so. I think I, yeah. I think I think disk can. I think the perception is that disk is disk is cheap because it's ready avail ready and available now. But um, you know, it's 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 still expensive. It still needs to be backed up. It still needs to be secured. So the less of it we've got to manage, the better. In uh, in my book. Exactly. Well, our next topic is alert intelligence, and this actually uh, reflects back on a conversation I had with uh, an IBM I prospect uh, that was not using an IBM. Uh, or a help systems monitoring tool, and they said that their their homegrown alerting tool was sending them so many alerts that they just ignore everything. So that's obviously not a good thing. So either they didn't know how to manage the tool or didn't know how to modify the tool, but ultimately it was bombarding them with a plethora of notifications that, like I said, they just uh, started to ignore too many false pos positives and uh, so forth. And that's where the alert intelligence feature was really born. So, Ash, describe what alert intelligence does. There's a challenge, Chuck. Yeah, it, it, allows, you to, it allows you to link multiple rules together. Um, and that sounds quite simplistic, but um, exactly what you just said, people, people used to come to us and say we love Halcyon and it's great I can get alerts for everything but I'm getting alerts for everything now so almost victims of our own success so we, we came up with something called alert intelligence and that allows you to link rules together so um, I'm going to give you some some examples in a minute but um, you know you might be you might be in, you're interested in your ASP hitting 90 percent if your end of day hasn't run yet, for example, if your end of day is run, hey, you might not be interested. Or maybe you've got a, a, a backlog with mimics, um, which at the end of an end of day is not a problem. You know, you know, it's going to catch up in 40 minutes or an hour. But at any other time, maybe that's a problem. So you can start to link these these intelligent steps together. And that's exactly what we do with alert intelligence. And I'm going to going to jump into the into the tool now, because it's it's often easier to uh, to show alert intelligence than uh, than explain it. I find. So uh, what have I got here? I've I've got three rules. If I share this, uh, we've got a QCIS a QCIS hist rule here. Checking that the end of day has completed, and when it completes, hey, we could receive a enterprise console alert, an email, or a text, or something. Um, and that's fine. Um, what else have I got? I've got a performance rule in here. Looking for ASP growth. Tell me when I've grown 5% in 30 minutes. You know, that's an indicator of a, a runaway query or malformed query or something like that. And maybe I've got something in the mimics monitor. That is looking for a backlog. Now, individually, if I was to get an alert for one of those things, I may not think anything about it. If I was to get, to get an alert for, for two of those things, I might be starting to think, oh, if there's something under the covers that's that's not quite right. And this this can happen quite often. We often see uh, teams of people, or maybe different people, are receiving these alerts or acting upon them. But when you start to put these three things together, they might mean something a bit more. So. Let's uh, let's have a look what we can do with alert intelligence to, to help with that. 
So here's the alert intelligence product. So it's just another rule-based product that dovetails into to everything else. And we create rules in exactly the same way. So we, we have this, which you'll all be used to. This is the rule header. So this describes when the rule should be active based on calendar, day, date, time. And what we should do if we receive an alert, should we go to sleep? Should we just carry on checking every minute, etc.? And then we have the criteria. And with alert intelligence, this is the uh, this is the key thing. So the three rules that I showed you before, these three rules, we've linked them. We've linked them together. So we're saying if that happens, that happens, and that happens, I want one thing to occur. I want to carry out one action. So all of a sudden you've you've reduced your uh, your alert intake from three down to one and that one is potentially more meaningful than those three individually so we found this we found some real success with this uh, with this actually because you can actually link up to 12 rules together you can also say not so if you're looking for something that should happen and it hasn't happened again you can pop that into into this now each every environment's slightly different but i'm sure all of you can probably think of some some probably use cases there more imaginative than um, than i've been but having the ability to to interconnect rules is uh, is really powerful i'd love the ability to to put this into into multi platform at some stage so if that's happened on a windows server and that's not happened on an i i want one rule so maybe we'll get there one day but for for the moment all on the green screen up to 12 rules and positives and uh, and negatives we wow. can link there very cool i can see some applications for that certainly and and uh, especially with the not option you know what has not happened so that's Definitely. uh that's cool Highly flexible, which is really what we're trying to do is, you know, be flexible to our uh, our users' needs. So speaking of the needs of the users, let's talk end users. So how do you know if your system is performing well or badly? Is it just response time? I like to say you don't know where you're going until you've started to keep track of where you've been. So Performance Analyzer provides the insight into the performance data, the devil's in the details, so to speak. So if you do have a performance issue today, you can go back and check to see if, for instance, you had the same performance hit yesterday or last week or maybe last month. And as my friend Ash likes to say, what's measured is managed. And your IT manager executive level might want to see some performance related reports on a regular basis. So Ash, take us through Performance Analyzer. I certainly will, Chuck, I certainly will. So I guess similar to the disk space manager, um, the performance anal analyzer part is, is the devil behind the detail. In level two, you can monitor for, for CPU, disk, memory, etc., and get alerted. But realistically, it's not, it's not telling you what's causing that problem. It's not giving you any history either. So these, these, are, the, these are the things that I would want to know. How does it compare to last week, last month? You know, is this a, is this a norm? Um, also graphically, again, we have a GUI that I'll jump into shortly, but many other customers have, have it on a plasma somewhere, somewhere very visible, where if there is a performance issue, you'll see some, you'll see some very kind of tall uh, red skyscrapers appear and people can jump onto the, uh, jump onto the green screen to take a look. Um, you can go back in time and with performance analyzer, you can you can get a picture. It's almost like a historical work at job. What do things look like at three o'clock this morning? You can go through QHIS, but you, you've got so much activity in there. You can't really see the wood for the trees. Um, a lot of people like to pull this data off and to, to, to push it into Excel to do some number crunching on it. So we've got that as well. So let, let me let me jump into the product. I will tell you what, we'll start off, we'll start off with the GUI. Not a lot, of, not a lot of activity on my uh, my partition again. So this is this is P6. You've got multiple partitions. You can have uh, you can have the GUI toggle round. 
So it will spend X number of seconds and then toggle around to, to different partitions. And these are, these are shipped views in effect. So this is showing me here what we look like right now. Again, I'm only, I'm only hitting 10 to 15 percent, so not really a lot of activity. So this is a summary. I've got the same information for, uh, for, for memory pools, my ASP and, uh, and my details. But I can also design my own panels as well. My own panels and my own views. If I go into, a, into an edit mode, let's, uh, let's just edit this here. I'm going to edit panels. Uh, bear with me one moment. Panels. We'll just edit this panel here. I can decide what I want to see in here. And the kind of metrics you can see are the things that you can create rules for within level two. So these kind of metrics here, these are the kind of things you'd be interested in, and you can have them populate on the graph. It updates every single minute. And when you hit a threshold, you can get it to, uh, to flag as well. So you can get it to flash and to do something. So um, here we go, highlight. Maybe we want to highlight when we hit 85%. So we can do that as well. But you can also design your own uh, panels and your own pages. So if there's particular things you're interested in, hey, you can do that as well. So it's very much a, very much a visual thing. There's no drill down with this, like, uh, like some of our other stable products. There's no drill down, but it's, it's pretty, it's graphical and you can see at a glance what you're interested in. But I guess the, the, the detail is, uh, is, is really within here, within the green screen on Performance Analyzer. So let me jump into, uh, into the green screen product. And um, I guess the first thing we would do is, what do we look like now? Let's have a look at performance data. So this is similar to the IBM i performance tools. So it doesn't need those. We have our own um, our own calls and our own APIs, and the first thing we're seeing is uh, we're seeing five minute intervals. If we were to see a spike, here's the here's the biggest spike in my box, just here. I can zoom in. I can use F9 to zoom into this particular period here, four minutes, three minutes, two minutes, one minute period. And um, hey, maybe this is my biggest spike. And what I can see then, I get a picture of everything that we create can create a rule for and see what the value is at that particular time. But if I use F17, I can see a picture of the jobs that were running at that time. This was my spike just here. And I get a picture of all the jobs that are running at the time by default sorted in CPU. So at a glance, you can see what the problem was. Again, not on my box. Um, hardly anything going on. So I can view that job. This was the problem job. This, this is my interactive session here. This was the problem job. Um, I can go forward. I can go backwards. I can see what it looks like right now. I can see go backwards, see when it entered the system, or go forwards and see when it left the system. So you can interrogate data uh, real time. We've also got some other modes of data as well that you can interrogate similarly. Uh, memory pools is, uh, is probably the most interesting, again, not in my box, not a lot of activity there. But again, you've got that data, you've got that raw data. And with that raw data, you can report on it. So if we jump into, into reports here, we've got all of these, uh, what we call canned reports here. So if this is something you're interested in, you can simply select that menu option, it'll create a green screen report. So there's a number of canned reports in there but you can also build your own reports. And this is really where the, uh, where the power is. So we can print a system report and select which metrics we're actually interested in. And again, these are all metrics or attributes that we, we can create rules for in level two. So level three just allows you to report on them and to generate either green screen reports, push something to the IFS for pulling into Excel or generate uh, PDFs on the IFS also. So incredibly powerful. And one other thing I wanted to show you while we're in here, I do apologize for the speed that we're going at today, but um, typically each one of these you know, sub products 
I'm showing you will typically take about an hour, maybe even an hour and a half in the Displace Manager terms to actually show you. So we do need to go at quite a rate of knots. But um, this is a historical work at job. This is job history here. If I just hit enter on this, it just takes a few seconds to actually uh, show me the real data to begin with. This box is, uh, is in the States. So this is, uh, this is a historical work at job. So I can go back to, um, let's go back to midnight. And this shows me what was going on at that particular time. I can see at a glance, I can see the status and the state of those jobs, how they ended, whether they have ended. And I can subset this data. You can't do this on QHIST. I can subset this data and show any particular jobs or particular users, or maybe even jobs that didn't finish properly. Maybe that's all I'm interested in. So we just sort that and we subset that. So these are all the jobs that haven't finished properly over the last day. Quite useful if you're trying to determine what happened in the wee hours when you come in in the morning. So Ash, I want everybody to uh, remember that you know all this is included in level three and there's more, all right? So spool file management, ultimately it's been a very manual process over the years. And if it gets ignored for a period of time, things can get out of control and disorganized very quickly. So face it, you're gonna have a lost report due to all the disorganization that you might have going on with your spool file management. And you might be asked to recreate that report at some time, and that's gonna take some of your day. So better to get ahead of the head of the wave, so to speak, get things under control with spool file management, just like proactive monitoring. Do it up front and do it automatically. Ash, let's dive into this. And we've got about seven minutes left. Seven minutes, no problem at all. So I often think of spool files as being almost an Achilles, Achilles heel of IBM I. It doesn't really handle them very well. And these are some of the uh, some of the use cases that um, that people speak to me about. Um, I don't know if I can delete them. I, I don't know if I sh should delete them. They're old, but I don't know if I can delete them. Maybe they're needed for uh, financial purposes. I know over in uh, in Europe we have to keep uh, certain spool files pertaining to financial records for seven years. Um, I'd like to delete them. Maybe I could delete them, but I, maybe I first need to archive them. So I'm going to show you how we can we can actually archive these. Um, we can actually look inside spool files as well at the raw data. Um, maybe just look at a total and produce a, a smaller page, just showing you the total and delete that 700 page report. But let me just jump into uh, into spool file manager. So with level two, you can monitor for, for output queues. You can monitor depth and age. You can also distribute. So the difference between level two and level three is in level three, you can actually archive spooled files. So if I jump into here, what I've got here is I've actually got one spool file here, which I've, which I've archived. So I can do that via a rule. I can say anything older than X number of days or anything created by a particular user or a particular program, I want to do something with. Well, that do something with can be to archive it. So I've, I've just got one archive spooled file here. And um, I think I archived this yesterday or the, or the day before. I can look at the history on this. So a couple of days ago, I actually archived this. I can see where it originated, what job origin it originated from, and when it was created. The, the, the power is being able to retrieve this. So I can actually retrieve that spooled file. So retrieve it, it will retrieve it onto the originating queue. I don't need to go hunting for it. And the key thing here is it retrieves it with the same credentials as well, which is uh, which is incredibly powerful. So you don't need to you know go hunting for that spool file. It's it's exactly what uh, what you expect. So let me just uh, go away and archive uh, a couple of spool files here. So these these are my spool files. This is a Halcyon work with spooled files. So it's like the IBM one, but um, you can do a lot more with it. You can actually PDF stuff straight from here. You can run scripts 
we haven't got time to go into scripts today, but I can I can design a script that looks at spooled files. I might not be interested in all this 1,000 pages, but I can design a script that delves into that spool file and does some intelligent things with it and maybe splits it based on totals or regions and things like that. But we're talking about archiving today, so let me just archive something. Again, this is manually, but hey, you can archive that uh, automatically as well. So that's been archived. And then for your user community, when they go into their archive spool files, you can control what they see. So I'm using a, I've picked up a template here, which is just showing my own spool file. It's shown my own spool file for the last seven days, but that's something you can create, a, you can control as well. And I think, yeah, so this is the, this is a template that I'm using to view my spooled files. This is my profile. And I'm just looking at the last seven days. So you can push these templates to users and have them whenever they go into work spool files, you control what they see. So another incredibly powerful product. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into any more detail here, but it does allow you to get spool off the eye and into archives, retrieval archives as well. Back to All you. All right. Sir. Yeah. So our last topic for today is around the log file monitor, and and uh, as Ash knows, I'm a I'm a pilot. I'm a flight instructor on the side and enjoy that very much, it's my hobby. And I like to refer to these logs as kind of like the black box flight recorder on an airliner. Traditionally, this data is difficult to see and harvest from the logs due to typically because the, the uh, format of the data is very much non-standard, it all depends on who wrote the application. And typically it's buried in an IFS subfolder somewhere. So it's a great source of value to monitor and try to pinpoint exactly what's happening in your application. But often this log file data is never monitored. But now with the log file monitor, you can monitor it proactively. Ash. Yeah, it's always been difficult to get at log file data because many applications, they, they write away to, to log files in, in various formats. So you always need a, a flexible format log file monitor. And that's exactly what we've come up with. And this, this is one of the most comprehensive products we've got. I think probably to demo this properly would, would probably take 90 minutes. So I'm gonna condense that into about three or four minutes. And th these are the use cases. This is why we, we, we first tackled and wrote this product about four years ago. And it used to be a standalone product. It's now included in level three, um, but it has the ability to, uh, to monitor log files generated by these applications and more. Um, it can also monitor the content of a a standard DB2 file, a physical file. So it's not necessarily just a log file monitor. It can also monitor external data sources. Our friends at IN4, they had some challenges monitoring some XML, and this XML was never written to disk, it was constantly being updated. So we've written something that can look at that. And then finally, this is a, this is a bugbear, uh, certificates. Every IBMI in the world will have some certificates. And most people are either not aware of them or they don't know when this certificate is going to expire. And they can be horrible. When things expire, things can fall over in a big heap and it's not completely obvious that it's due to a certificate expiring. So I'm going to show you how we can, uh, how we can handle these kind of things. So again, we have jump into work with rules. It's just another rule-based product. Let's push it to the top using F9 and we'll open up the uh, the log file monitor. So how does this uh, how does this work? Well, we we first of all describe where the file is, we point to the file. So this is an Apache log file. In reality you'd be you'd be more generic, you'd probably have an asterisk here and we'd look inside any log file. Um, you describe what what type it is as well. So there's a number of types that we can monitor. And I expect us to add to this over the years, as and when we come across different types of uh, types of log files. But th this has been adequate for now. And we, you can decide whether you want to monitor anything that goes into the log file, 
at each interval, so every minute, or whether we should just pick up where we left off. And then as we page down here, if I F2 in here, this, this is our log file. So this is a log file residing on the IFS that, that contains a, a, an awful lot of raw data. This is the raw data. This is what it looks like here. So in reality, we'd, we'd be maybe interested in this, in this text string here. And that's exactly what we can do. So as soon as we look at that log file, we split this into a, a number of fields. We say, based on what you've told us, this is what that log file looks like. And you can customize this. You know, we have, we have a best guess based on the log file, but you can override this. You can also perform calculations on these fields as well. So you can say, this is, this is an error ID field. It's, it's uh, 14 characters long, but I want to do a calculation. I only want to pick out the, maybe the middle six characters. You can do that as well. So you describe where it is, describe what the file looks like, and then simply we have a rule over it like any other Halcyon product. You decide when it's active. You then have some criteria. And in this one, we're simply looking for is the text. Does it have shutting down somewhere in the middle of it? Nice, easy one, Apache log files. Um, we'll skip BRMS, I think, in the in the interest of, uh, of time. But um, there is a, where are we? This one here, this one's incredibly powerful. So this is looking at an external source. So this is actually a Windows server where I've got some XML. That's the type here. And if I just F2 there, I've got lots of XML. This goes on for pages and pages and pages. And using the Halcyon log file monitor, I've, I've simplified that. I'm just looking at, at this chunk of XML and I want to extract things. And what we're doing here is we're we're basically saying that there should be a number of jobs that are listed in this XML, and if there are anything missing, we are we're popping them into a into a field, and we create a rule, and we compare a static list with a list that's running, and we do that via a rule as well. And I'm going to show you one more thing: certificates in here, uh, which is back here on this session here. As I say, this is this is a real bugbear with customers. So everybody has a has a certificate store, and this is uh, this is typically how you check it at the moment. This is the URL you have to go to. Um, you pick a certificate store. I'm going to go into system and pop in my password, and you can then manage those certificates. But you've got to do this. You've got to do this regularly. You've got to remember to do this. And uh, where are we? Manage certificates. Uh, expiration. Let's check the expiration of certificates. So this is a bit long-winded. So tell me anything that's due to expire in the next uh, next year. And hey, would you know it? I've got a couple of that expired, and I've got some that are due to expire later this year. We can simplify that. We can create a rule. So we simply we probably have this wake up every week, once a week. Uh, sorry, once a day. We'd have this wake up once a day. It's going the, to the, the system store. And this is what we see. If I display that data, exactly what I've shown you from a browser is what we see here. These are the certificates. This is what they're called. And these are the days, all the expiration days. These are going to expire in less than a year. So I should be doing something about these if these are still used. So incredibly powerful and really be aware of certificates and expiration dates. There are lots within the eye, lots used in the eye. Potentially they've been added at some stage prior to you maybe uh, performing the role that you do now. So just uh, just be aware of those. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good advice. So I'm going to open the next polling question. How can help systems assist you so maybe you'd like a demo of level three components you'd like to try a level three or perhaps you'd like a tech update conversation and that's where ash or myself we would talk to you about the products you own we talked to you about uh, the roadmap for those products some of the changes uh, as well as 
uh, what's going on from a corporate standpoint at Help Systems. And all of that is based on uh, a two-way conversation. So learning about what your roadmap priorities and projects are, and uh, we're looking for you know places where potentially we can assist, and certainly to give you some visibility into what's new uh, at Help Systems, which is ever changing. And uh, while you take uh, just a few moments to respond to the polling question, Ash, we do have just a couple of questions and I realize we've gone just a little bit over, but I think these uh, questions are important. So one of the questions is, um, how much disk space does the Halcyon Disk Space Manager take up with its collections? Cool, good question. It's um, it's, it's not as much as you think, actually. It's um... I think it's, it's something about 30, 35 meg uh, for the product, so it's, it's small. Um, each build is about 5 meg, and then each object is about 128 bytes. Um, but the key thing is you're in control of that. There is some, um, some tidying up that the product does automatically. You control how many builds or how many months worth you keep before we start to reduce that data. So totally at your control, that is, Chuck. Okay. Question about the disk space manager also. Um, uh, can reports be automatically uh, distributed? Yes. Yeah. So those views that I went in that you can simply turn into reports at the, the click of a button, you can have those automatically produced every time you do a build. So every week or, or every night. And you can simply pair those reports with the, with the sport file manager or the output queue monitor, which you get in level one and level two, to look for them being created and simply, when they've been created, distribute them as PDFs or uh, CSVs. So, yeah, that's a, a good example where two products work uh, work well together. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, with that, Ash, and for all of our attendees. We appreciate your time today. Ash, do you have any final words? No, all good, thank you, Chuck. I'd like to just thank everybody for their time and um, I hope to speak to you again soon. Yeah, thanks everybody, have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.